need to get down to business. They only gave me three hours, so we have to be quick. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. In the fall of 2002, do the math, that's 20 years ago, my wife and I got tricked into coming to this church. We were not churchgoers. Two people that were churchgoers, members here, said, you want to go to dinner? And we said, sure. They were clients of ours. So we had to say, sure. Turned out dinner was a spaghetti fundraiser in the basement of this church building. <laughs> Sorry, I'll just pause every now and then because I catch eyes with people that I've known for so long and it, it just, I can't keep talking, I'll start crying. The spaghetti fundraiser got over with and we came upstairs. Most of you probably don't know this, but there's a giant curtain hanging up in the ceiling up here. Did y'all know that? When we came upstairs, the giant curtain was down. And I thought, oh, dinner and a show, this ought to be great. <laughs> this place was packed. It was a Wednesday night, and this place was packed. Right up there were Ken and Lisa are. You know, Ken, what are you like? Hey, Ken. Hi, Lisa. Right there were Ken and Lisa are sitting. That's where Stacy and I were sitting. And we heard, da, 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 Right? The curtain came up. There were some great big chairs with guys in three-piece suits, 150,000 people in a choir. <laughs> Angels started singing. And some lady jumped up behind me and went, Jesus, 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 Jesus. I didn't go to church. And I wanted to turn around and go, he probably heard you the first time. You can quit now. Because I did not understand the power of the name at that point, right? I think she was saying it for me because I was right in front of you. Oh, Jesus, 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 Jesus. <laughs> you said I believe, kind of, because he's, well, then. So we got tricked into coming here. If you ever want to bring somebody to church, invite them to dinner, have a spaghetti fundraiser. They're trapped. <laughs> Pastor L.H. Hardwick. I miss that guy. He got up out of one of the big chairs and in his grandfatherly way, he welcomed all of us. The reason this place was packed was because Jim Simbla from the Brooklyn Tabernacle was here. He had with him the last survivor from the World Trade Center collapse. It had been one year. It was the fall of 2002. She was a young lady from Trinidad and Tobago and she had had a miraculous encounter during her extrication from the rubble. And she became a believer and she was here to give her testimony. Pastor Hardwick welcomed everybody. The choir sang. The young lady gave her testimony. Jim Simbola preached a sermon. I think there's probably some more praying, some more singing. I don't really remember. Because halfway through that evening, my wife started crying. Halfway through that evening, I started crying. We were not people who cried. There are people like in movies when you see them cry, you look at them and you go, aw. <laughs> then there's people like me and Stacy, and when we cry, you look at us and go, ooh. <laughs> it was that kind of crying. We call it snot bubble crying. Because what happened that night is that Pastor Hardwick, the choir, that young lady from Trinidad and Tobago, Jim Simbla, they said, here we are, God. Living sacrifices. Now you do through us whatever you wanna do. And he used those individuals he reached through those individuals and he grabbed the heart of my wife and he grabbed the heart of me and he drew us inextricably back into the kingdom in a way that changed the trajectory of our existence forever. Hallelujah. Not here on earth, forever. <laughs> Jesus, 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 Jesus. Maybe he would do that again this morning. Maybe he would do that again this morning. 
Maybe we should pray that together. Holy Spirit, would you flow through every person who avails themselves to you right now to reach the heart of some, everyone in this room? Convict and encourage and inspire something within us to dream what we haven't dreamed, to be what we haven't been, and do what we haven't done. Could you do that today, please? Father, please. We beg this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen? So not many weeks after that night, um, somebody stood up here and said, we need help with our room in the inn ministry. We need somebody to cook for and spend the night with 12 homeless guys. Me, great. Stacy, great, we're in. You ever spent the night with 12 homeless guys? You don't sleep. I'll tell you that you don't sleep. The chorus of snore is a thing to behold because just about the time one guy drifts off, another guy starts. Like I would replicate it, but it's just obnoxious. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. We weren't gonna sleep anyway because that night, it was a Monday. It was in the fall of 2002. And Monday in the fall means Monday night football. So as soon as the meal was over, poof, 11 guys jump up and run for the television. One guy stayed at the table. His name was Donald. He stayed at the table because he had cerebral palsy and it was kind of tough for him to get up. And he just softly sang a song while Stacy cleaned up. She came and got me and said, you need to come hear this. So I walked over and she introduced me. I said, Donald, you singing a song? Yes, sir. I said, what song are you singing? He said, you want to hear it? Well, yeah. You sit down here, I'll sing it for you. I don't know what the future holds. And I don't know about today. But I know who holds my hand. And I know he leads the way. So come what may from day to day. I won't ever stray for the Lord. He is good to me. He has never failed me yet. He has never failed me yet. He was five feet, two inches tall. He weighed 260 pounds. He had cerebral palsy. He was released from a drug rehabilitation facility that morning. He was friendless, homeless, penniless, jobless. And I looked at him and thought, brother, if there's a poster child for somebody that God has failed, you're it. That's how ignorant to the ways of God I was. I thought God was supposed to make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. Donald knew a God who could sustain him through every single difficulty of life and give him hope where it seemed hope did not exist. I said, Donald, what are you going to do tomorrow? I don't know. Well, Donald, you got any family you can call? No, sir. They had told us these guys are some of the best con men in Middle Tennessee. So don't believe their story. Don't give them your phone number. Don't give them any money. Feed them. Keep them warm. Make them breakfast. Give them a sack lunch and send them on their way. We did that. But before I could get up, that song convicted me so much. I said, okay, Donald, here. I wrote down my phone number. I gave it to him. I reached in my pocket. I pulled out 20 bucks. I said, here, this is what I want you to do. Tomorrow morning, I want you to go to the McDonald's on the corner of 12th and Broadway downtown because they were going to drop them off downtown. I want you to buy some food, have some breakfast. Don't be indigent. Sit there. Stay warm. I've got a meeting that's going to get over at 9 o'clock. I want you to leave the McDonald's at 9 o'clock and walk across the street to the Exxon station. There's a pay phone there. Okay, ladies. <laughs> Back in my day... <clears throat> 
I love y'all. Thank you for laughing. <laughs> I'm not, look, I'm not kidding. He, There's a payphone. I want you to call me. Ring, ring, 10 minutes after nine. Donald, what'd you figure out? What do you mean? Well, Donald, do you have any family that you could call right now? No, sir. You got any friends at all in Middle Tennessee? Anybody you can think of? To call? No, sir. Donald, aside from the 20 bucks I gave you, do you have any money? No, sir. Donald, aside from the clothes that you were wearing yesterday, do you have anything in this world? No, sir. Donald, what are you going to do? I don't know. Let's shorten the story. Three o'clock that afternoon, my wife and I jumped in the car. We drove downtown. We picked Donald up. We took him home, and he lived with us for the next 90 days. One night, he had a dream. He dreamed that he was a street evangelist. He was back out preaching. So we found out about the Teen Challenge Ministry Institute in Jacksonville, Florida, that trained street preachers. We got him enrolled, we put him in our car, and we drove him to Jacksonville, Florida. He'd never seen the ocean, so we stopped there first, right? But he's got cerebral palsy, and he's only about this tall. And he's, so he doesn't walk through the sand really well. He's in the passenger seat, so I turned him around, and I, I took his shoes and socks off and rolled his pant legs up for him, and he grabbed my arm. And the two of us walked through the sand into the water. And he stood there. And I watched tears flood down his face. He said, I've never seen anything this beautiful in my whole life. I walked him back to the car, set him in the passenger seat, dried off his feet, put his shoes and socks back on him, rolled his pant legs down. We drove him to his dorm room got him checked into school, and we drove away. Snot bubble crying. Because you see, it wasn't Donald's life that had been changed. It was ours. Donald was still Donald. I don't know what it, right? Donald was still Donald. We were no longer who we were. We had discovered the power that makes disciples of Jesus Christ. We had discovered what it is to live a life for something greater than self. We had discovered the power of transformation that's born in this single word, love. We couldn't go back. We were ruined. And in that moment, something clicked. Digging through scripture, every time the doors are open, we're here and something clicked. To give you a picture of what clicked, I need to take you somewhere. Will y'all come with me? No, this is really audience participation. Will you come with me? Thank you, that helps. <laughs> Otherwise, I think you're sleeping with your eyes open. <clears throat> Which my guys can do, I promise. <laughs> I want to take you to the side of a hill in the northern part of Israel, in a region called Galilee, where Jesus grew up. He's standing there with 11 guys in their late teens and early 20s. He has been wrongfully accused, tried, beaten, crucified, buried, somehow came back from the dead, and now he's standing on the side of a hill with 11 guys who have known him every step of his ministerial life. This is the last time that he's going to talk to them in the northern part of the country. This is where they all grew up, every single one of them. And he said this, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now, look, stop, stop. Jesus made everything. If you don't believe me, read the opening to the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, 
The word was with God. The word was God. All things were made through him. Nothing was made that was not made through him. Skip, skip, skip. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us for a while. There it is. He made it all. He is the word of God made flesh, right? But he gave dominion to man. Some authority was handed over. Man lost it to Satan. Jesus bought it back at the cross. If you want a picture, go read Revelation chapter five. That's the picture. So now he can say with absolute truth and absolute confidence, all authority in the heavens and in every realm and on earth has been given to me. There is no authority that exists that he's not on top of. He is the Lord. We got to get that. Y'all get it? Y'all get it? He is the Lord. All authority belongs to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them. Four action words. Go, make disciples, baptize, and teach. We're going to come back to that. Now, I want to show you something. I look at things like this and go, that's pretty simple. I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to go make disciples and baptize and teach. But then I read a letter like what Paul wrote to the Corinthians, where in the first chapter, before he can even get out of the first chapter, he says this, I thank God that I didn't baptize any of you. But Jesus said, go make disciples, baptize, teach. I thank God I didn't baptize any of y'all. They were having some squabbling. He's trying to make a point. I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius, lest somebody should say that I baptized in my own name. Oh, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. He's like me. He's getting old and forgetting things. I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides that, I don't really remember Because Christ did not send me to baptize, he sent me to preach the gospel. But didn't Jesus just say, go make disciples, baptize, teach? Let you in on a secret. When you read scripture and you find what looks like this super colliding argument, look, God's not a man that he should lie. He's the same always. It's completely filled with integrity. That's the Holy Spirit inviting you to start digging. There's something to see, something to learn. So let's go back to our scene. Jesus is on the side of a hill with 11 guys in their late teens and early twenties. He says, I am the Lord. So Matthew, here's what I want you to do. Peter, here's what I want you to do. Thomas, here's what I want you. Nope. If Paul were like me, colloquially redneck, which he wasn't, he might have said, sorry, if Jesus were colloquially a redneck, he might have said, I want all y'all to go make disciples. Was the command he gave individual and specific or was it collective and unified? Wait, 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 wait. It's narrow gate. We have some axioms. When theologically forced into an either or, 99% of the time, choose both and and you'll probably be right. Was it individual and specific or was it collective and unified? Which one was it? Oh, y'all are so brilliant. Y'all want to all come to narrow gate? You could, Scott, you want to come to narrow gate? Move in? Your wife would kill you. (laughs) It's both and. It's a collective edict. And we can see it in scripture. We can see that it is a collective command. But before we go there, we have to notice something. We have to notice this. Not only is it collective, it's also specific. Because these four words, go, make disciples, baptize, and teach, they're not the same. One of them is this super powerful, active, ongoing verb. It's like a, it just, it's got weight. The other four, they're just participles. Y'all know what a participle is? You're going back to school. A participle is when you take an activity and you make it into a thing. Run. 
running, right? I started running, right? That's a participle. Hey, that was a pretty good impression, I thought. <laughs> Y'all got to lighten up a little bit. We're not, three hours is a long time. <laughs> running, <laughs> pretty good. I know what love is, <laughs> which is a great line, by the way. Golly, but that's a different sermon. Okay, back to ours. They're participles. One of them is a super powerful verb. You ready? Go is not that word. Baptize, eh, it's not that word. Teaching them to obey, not that word. Make disciples. I am the Lord of everything. I am the Lord of everything. I am the Lord of everything. So make disciples. Then what is go? Go is just existential. So y'all are going to go about your day, right? There it is. That's go. Because you exist, I'm now going to give you a purpose. Make disciples. That is your purpose. That is your reason. That is your command. That is your everything. Make disciples. Baptize is the evidence of a saving faith that exists within. Think of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter eight. Philip jumps up in the cart with him. They're riding along. He hears the gospel presented from Isaiah and he goes, there's water. What prohibits me from being baptized? And Philip said, nothing if you believe. There's the faith. So, he said, I'll tell you what I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Philip goes, yep, good enough. Stop the cart. <laughs> Baptism, the great first act of obedience, the great pronouncement of the faith that lives within that saves you forever and ever and ever. Yeah. Teaching them to obey all things I've commanded you, that's sanctification. So let's take it apart. Because you exist, I'm going to give you a purpose. Make disciples. You'll know when you're doing it when you see people come to saving faith and they begin to change because you've taught them how to obey who I am and what I am. Y'all get it? So what is your job as Christ church? What is your job? Make disciples. Let's say it again. What's your job? Make disciples. Three times a charm. What is your job? Do you? Mozart said the most powerful piece of music ever written is the rest. The silence. Do you? Now, before we all start beating ourselves up, I want to look at a couple passages to close this thing out and then leave with an observation. How is it that we collectively, in unified fashion, go about this job of making disciples. The first one's found in Ephesians chapter four. Y'all read along with me. They're gonna put it on the screen. Ephesians chapter four says, and he himself, that's Jesus, that's God, gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now look, before we read on, I've gotta stop and focus on the first part. God gave some to be what we call the fivefold ministry. You see it? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Y'all see it? I think choir ought to be in there too, but that's just me. I didn't write it, so I don't get to call the shots. God gave some to be apostles. They establish. We're going to talk about this in a minute. Apostles, prophets, they proclaim. Evangelists, pastors, shepherds, teachers. Why? for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. It is not your pastor's job to make disciples. Sorry. It is not your staff's job to make disciples. It's their job to equip you so that you can make disciples. Yes, also specifically it's their job too, but that's because they're just playing a part 
till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, there it is, to a perfect man, to the measure of the statute of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in, remember that power we found? Love. May grow up. There's the command. Grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, that's you, by the way, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, that's you, by the way, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Do you? How does this break down? There are passages which you know well that talk about the body. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12. They have exhaustive statements about the functioning of the body. Let's look at the one in Romans 12. It says, for as we have many members in one body, but all the members don't have the same function, we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Yeah. Now stop. Before we go to the next passage, you need to hear this. When we say gifts, the majority of us in this room think about the charismata, the overflowing of the Holy Spirit. And that's right. It's not complete, but it's right. Here's what he says. If prophecy, that's it, right? Right? If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Ministry, let us use it in ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts. Did you know exhortation is a gift from God? If you have that capacity, exhortation. He who gives with liberality, it's a spiritual gift. He who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy, with cheerfulness. Wow, <laughs> wow, guess what? That pretty much covers all y'all. Who here has no capacity for mercy whatsoever? Please hold your hand up. Anybody? No, you all have that capacity. You now have a job to do. Do you know your role? Do you perform your function so that the whole body grows together into Christ who is the head? Let's look at another passage in 1 Corinthians. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually, and God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, stop. That doesn't mean that they're the most important or that's the coolest. That's what the Corinthians thought. They were all jockeying for position. I was baptized by Paul. Well, I was baptized by Apollos. Well, I've got this gift. And I, he's like, nope, 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 nope. If I offered right now to just chop somebody's pinky toe off, anybody want that one? You want me to just like take a pair of scissors and clip, clip? But you need your pinky toe, right? Like, I don't know, need might be strong, but you'd like to keep it if it's intact currently. Every part matters. Every piece matters. And God appointed these in the church. First, apostles. Why? Because they established the whole thing. Second, prophets. Why? Because they proclaimed the truth of what is and is to come. Then teachers. After that, Miracles, gifts of healing, helps, administrations, variety of tongues. Hmm. Are all apostles? Everybody here a prophet? Is everybody a teacher? Do we all work miracles? Is that our job? Everybody's just supposed to do miracles all the time. Do all have the gifts of healing? No. Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? but earnestly desire the best gifts. 
Look, Paul is saying this. He's saying all this stuff. You should want all of this. Beg for it. Drive for it. Live for it. But I'm going to show you a fuller way. And he follows it in the next chapter with this in 1 Corinthians 13. You know this. But let it set differently this time. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, if I don't love, I'm just noisy, sounding brass, banging cymbals. If I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all mystery and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could move mountains, if I don't love, Nothing. If I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, give my body to be burned, have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long. It's kind, it doesn't envy, it's not proud, it doesn't parade itself around, it's not puffed up, it doesn't behave rudely, it doesn't seek its own, it's not provoked, it doesn't think on evil things, it doesn't rejoice in iniquity. It rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. But love is not a gushy, warm emotion. Oh yeah, that comes with it. The tears and the empathy and the sympathy and the passion and the drive, it all comes with it. But love is intentional, decided, chosen, selflessness. That's what love is. That's what God is. A decided selfless. Philippians 2, ready? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in lowliness of mind, esteem others more highly than yourself. Let everyone look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Have in you all, y'all, this mind, which also was in Christ, who being in very form God, he didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant, coming in the likeness of men. You think that's not chosen selflessness? Therefore, God has highly exalted him, given him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those above the earth and on the earth and below the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus is all authority and heaven and earth has been given to me. So make disciples. You'll know it's going right when you see people coming to faith and changing from the inside out. Because love never fails. I want to make a proposition, ask a question, but I want to see if we can get Christopher up here to play, and I'll tell you why. that A again, will you? Hey, Chris, how many cycles per second is that? 440. 440 cycles per second. You go up an octave. How many cycles is that? Go down to how many is that? See, it's just math. No, I'm serious. It's all it is. It's just math. When Chris writes charts, it's got ones and fours and six minuses and it's just math. You can start playing Does that sound like math to you? You tell me what kind of spiritual transformation happens in the confluence of a mathematical equation that can reach in and grab your heart and just soften it. God chose three, made three archangels 
one of might, one of message, and one of music. Worship. Paul wrote to the Hebrews. I'm just, if you're a theologian, you want to argue with me, we can do it afterward, okay? In the letter to the Hebrews, it says this. If you hear his voice today, please don't toughen up your heart. That's what music does. It softens your heart. So I'm going to ask you the question we started with. Do you? I made everything because I love you. I sacrificed everything because I love you. All I want to do now is take you and work through you to love somebody else so that they too can know who I am and how I am and be transformed by that. Will you give yourself to be who I made you to be and do what I made you to do so that collectively I can work through this body to draw one more person into the throne room of grace and save them forever? God, I don't know if I can afford the time. (laughs) I don't know if I can afford the money for. You have no idea what my calendar. But I'm Lord. I'm the Lord. Are you doing? all of everything that God has asked you to do because he won't ask you to give more than he's willing to resupply. He won't ask you to do a job that you're not equipped to fulfill. Do you love? Do you choose selflessness so that someone else can advance? God, would you give us grace? As all of us bow our heads, I'm going to be the first to raise my hand and say, Father, please, for whatever has happened, that's just your grace. For whatever is yet to come that I haven't even seen, will you give me the grace to say yes when you ask it? Would you make us, this body, a unified, collective, obedient, sacrificial offering through which you could work and save forever. My hands up, Father. Please choose me. Please choose us. In the name of Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus the Christ, the Savior, of the world. Amen.